Judge, that completes the uh, victim impact statements. Thank you. At this time, the court will pronounce uh, judgment on the defendant. Mr. Goodell, based on your plea of guilty, entered on the 18th, 18th day of April, 2023. It is a finding of this court that you are guilty and are now ordered, adjudged, and decreed guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. That's a not violation of Iowa Code sections 701 or 707.1 and 707.21a. Mr. Goodell, I've considered all the sentencing options provided for in the Iowa Code, and my judgment relative to sentence um, is based on the factors that um, your attorney and the state's attorney and um, this, these last two days we've been talking about, but your rehabilitation uh, certainly is paramount for that and at the same time protecting the community uh, from further offenses by you and others is also um, what a judge does. And I have considered the, not just the brutal nature of the offense, but also the pre-sentence investigation and the minutes of testimony in this case, along with the entire court file. The plea agreement that you and your attorneys reach with the state, along with uh, all the juvenile sentencing factors that I'm required to make specific findings on uh, when we're sentencing a juvenile to um, a first degree murder, to class A felony, and the, the findings that your attorney and the state's attorney have gone through, I'll go with, through you, with you um, after I tell you first, um, I am going to order that you pay restitution joint and severally pursuant to Iowa Code Section 9103B, uh, $150,000 to the estate of Nahema Graber and or her heirs. And that's jointly and severally liable with uh, Chayden, William Willard Chaden Miller. I will also order the restitution that the def or that the state has requested regarding the uh, Jefferson County Auditor. But I do find, uh, based on your affidavit, and I did review your financial affidavit, that you do not have the ability to reimburse state of Iowa for category B restitution and because of that I Mr. Molding or Mr. Brown I don't know if you have a position on this I don't know if I can order the crime victim assistance if I make that finding I think that qualifies as category B restitution okay, you're right at this point Judge. okay so I'll just order the restitution joint and severally uh, that's owed to the Jefferson County Auditor. And, uh, but I will give the state of Iowa 30 days to file any additional restitution statements so long as they do not qualify as category B. You are ordered to uh, submit to a DNA sample as this is a felony offense. And pursuant to Iowa Code Section 9159A and B, uh, I am required to announce publicly that any non-mandatory term of incarceration may be reduced because of statutory good conduct time, work credits, program credits, and you may be eligible for parole before your sentence is discharged.
I am ordering um, that you serve um, the life sentence. You'll get credit for all time served on that. Going through the factors that I'm required to, I've considered the impact on the vic on each victim as defined in Iowa Code Section 91510 and um, the use of victim impact statements. And I will note that uh, your counsel has filed a sentencing mem memorandum, which I did read, and they cited State First Roby, which is 897 Northwest 2nd, 127 Iowa, 2017, and State First Lyle, which is 854 Northwest 2nd, 378, and that's an Iowa 2014 case. And uh, the argument from your counsel uh, is that uh, individualized juvenile sentencing generally serves to mitigate punishment, not aggravate punishment. Um, and I have found several mitigating factors in this case, but it's the court's belief that Iowa Code Section 902.122 does not prohibit me from considering aggravating factors. And in fact, I think I'm required under the law to consider all relevant and permissible sentencing factors. Um, so with respect to the impact on victims in this case, I think this is an aggravating factor because you participated in a plan with Mr. Miller to kill Noe McGraber and your actions uh, led or helped lead to the, her death. The victim impact statements remind us all of the pain that the family of Noe McGraber will kill it, carry with him and the huge void that she's left behind. I also say that with regard to the Lyle case, and I know um, Mr. Goodell, this is not, I mean, this is lawyer, I'm talking lawyer talk, but um, even if the Lyle factors are generally more mitigating in a typical juvenile murder case, I do not find this to be a typical juvenile murder case. This is beyond the pale. With respect to Factor number B, or letter B, the impact of the offense on the community. It's clear that Fairfield is a tight-knit, close community, and the entire community was shaken by your actions, Mr. Goodell, and your co-defendant's actions, Mr. Miller. So I do find that to be an aggravating factor that requires accountability. The next factor, the threat of uh, safety to the public or individual posed by the defendant. Uh, again, I think this is an aggravating factor um, as any individual, regardless of age, who could be persuaded by another classmate to kill his teacher is a danger to the community and will require significant rehabilitation. The degree of participation in the murder by uh, you, Mr. Goodell, is the next factor. And I find that you knowingly participated in the murder of Nahima Grammer and by your own admissions hit the victim with a baseball bat five times using legal, lethal force. While Mr. Miller concocted the plan without your help, the execution of that plan would not have occurred. So I find this as an aggravating factor and I don't, I don't think you have the same culpability as Mr. Miller. I think it's, it's less, but still without your help, he couldn't have done it. The nature of the offense is heinous. As, as you can imagine, it's a significant aggravating factor. Uh, Ms. Graber was killed in a brutal fashion by two of her own students. This murder requires the defendant to serve a prison sentence for deterrence of the entire community, not just the defendant. And for context, I think it's important to distinguish some of the facts from this case involving you and Willard Miller to uh, Miller versus Alabama, which is the U.S. Supreme Court case that uh, Dr. Cunningham has brought in to testify about and what we've had this last two days of hearing. The reason for the individualized Miller sentencing hearing is because while juveniles are different than adults, each juvenile and his or her acts are inherently different. Um, so I don't think, I am not comparing 
you just to a lump of Miller, of defendants that have had Miller hearings. Miller versus Alabama involved a 14-year-old defendant who assisted another juvenile in a robbery that resulted in a shooting. The defendant in Miller versus Alabama did not fire a gun or swing a bat. In a 6-3 decision, the United States Supreme Court found that the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment provided or prevented automatic life without parole uh, sentences for juvenile offenders. That's why we're having this, sent, this hearing. And subsequent 4-3 Iowa Supreme Court cases went further to take away the district court's ability to sentence a murderer under 18 to life without parole. So in spite of the mitigating factors presented by um, your defense through Dr. Cunningham, other testimony, and presentation of evidence and argument, the court finds a prison sentence and a mandatory minimum is required for deterrence for the defendant and others from committing murder in the first degree. As U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts wrote in his Miller dissent, our Eighth Amendment cases have also said that we should take guidance from evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. Mercy toward the guilty can be a form of decency, and a maturing society may abandon harsh punishments that comes to view that it comes to view as unnecessary or unjust. But decency is not the same as leniency. A decent society protects the innocent from violence. A mature society may determine that this requires remove, removing those guilty of the most heinous, heinous murders from its midst, both as protection for its other members and as a concrete expression of its standards of decency. As judges, we have no basis for deciding that progress toward greater decency can move only in the direction of easing sanctions of the guilty. With respect to your remorse, Mr. Goodell, and unlike your co-defendant, it's clear to me that you have regretted this role in Ms. Graber's murder. Um, You've been remorseful for these proceedings, and this is a mitigating factor. Factor G is your acceptance of responsibility. This is another mitigating factor, Mr. Goodell. You pled guilty to first-degree murder and acknowledged your actions. While you certainly have the right to exercise your constitutional rights to trial, to a jury, in a different place, um, like Mr. Miller, by pleading guilty, you spared the defendant's family, witnesses, and community a traumatic trial. And while these Miller sentencing uh, itself uh, are emotionally draining for all involved, and I doubt either Supreme Court's spent much time thinking about that toll uh, before ordering us to do hundreds of these hearings, the U.S. Supreme Court requires them. You're entitled to it. And uh, I certainly um, am required to do my job, and your attorneys have done their job very well in uh, presenting evidence. Regarding the severity of the offense, which is factor H, including any of the following, um, the commission of the murder while participating in another felony, a number of victims, and the heinous, brutal, cruel matter of murder, including whether the murder was the result of torture, I mentioned the, the offense is heinous, unusually heinous and cruel, uh, by stalking uh, Miss Graber and repeatedly hitting her with a bat. Again, I am in, I'm required to find that aggravating as a factor. There's one murder victim here, but many have felt the lasting effects, including yourself, of your actions and Mr. Miller's actions. Regarding your capacity, to appreciate the criminality of your conduct. I am required, and I, and I do consider your mature and developing brain in the sentencing hearing required by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Iowa Supreme Court. The defendant agreed to participate in the plan, Mr. Um, Miller and Mr. Goodale did, to kill uh, Nohema Graber. And this willful and premeditated murder is what resulted. 
you were 16 years old and the law treats you as an adult for the purposes of prosecution, but as uh, not as an adult for sentencing. And you have expressed genuine remorse that I did not see from your co-defendant. And this factor and the capacity to appreciate the criminality of your conduct, I think, is a mitigating factor. You stated that you um, never thought about the consequences. And I believe you when you say that, uh, when you agreed to help Willard Miller kill uh, Miss uh, Noah McRaper. The next factor is whether the ability to conform with the defendant's conduct with the requirements of law was substantially impaired. And uh, you didn't have any prior referrals to juvenile court services. And certainly uh, your mother's abandoning um, you and your family at a young age could have resulted in youthful misbehavior. It's not clear to me if you were under the influence or impaired when the murder was committed, though you were using marijuana. And I, I find this as a, as a mixed factor, um, but generally a mitigating factor. And then going to the level of maturity of you, Mr. Goodale, again, I think this is a mitigating factor based on the evidence presented there. While you were older than, than Mr. Miller, and um, it was clear to me that you were not more mature than him, and that Mr. Miller was far more sinister in his planning and the execution of this crime. Both the United States Supreme Court and the Iowa Supreme Court have held that juveniles are constitutionally different from adults for the purposes of sentencing, and that's Miller v. Alabama and State v. Sweet, um, 879 Northwest 2D811. That's an Iowa 2016 case. Mr. Goodell, you did not fully appreciate the consequences of your actions, but the analysis of maturity does not end there. While you were naive and immature, you aided Mr. Miller in, in murdering Noah McGraber. As everybody talked about, you knew the difference between right and wrong. Um, you were a bright student and still are a bright individual. And you could have stopped this from happening, and you know that. And that's probably going to be the hardest thing for you to live with. Regarding the next factor, which is the intellectual and mental capacity of the defendant, I think this is a mitigating factor. Your youth and lack of fully formed brain limited your capacity to appreciate the consequences of your acts. And while you were a very bright 16 and a half year old uh, and without a history of violence, I, I do find that to be mitigating. With respect to the nature and the extent of any prior juvenile delinquency or criminal history, um, I think this is a mitigating factor because I don't, uh, no evidence that to my knowledge you were as a pre previous criminal history and you are a good candidate for rehabilitation. And I think time will tell, but you'll be far more successful than Mr. Miller. The mental health history of the, of the defendant, and I didn't know about this until I read Ms. Dr. Cunningham's report of an undiagnosed ADHD and marijuana abuse um, in that 72-page evaluation. And prior to the report, I, I was unaware that, that undiagnosed mental health may have uh, affected this crime. But this was the first criminal offense you were adjudicated for, so I think that, that is a mitigating factor. The next factor, which is letter O, is the level of compulsion, duress, or influence exerted upon the defendant, but not to such extent as to consequence to a defense. So this is a mitigating factor to the extent that co-defendant Willard Chayden Miller influenced you to commit this crime. However, you could have notified law enforcement any time during the planning stages. Mr. Miller did not threaten you if you didn't assist him. There's no, you weren't protecting yourself in doing this. And certainly it's not a defense to assert peer pressure as why a defendant commits first degree murder. So while there's mitigation in this factor, there's also some aggravation as well. Letter P is the likelihood of the commission of further offenses by the defendant. And um, 
Well, there's no precise algorithm in determining whether you're going to commit any further offenses, Mr. Goodell, um, when you're released from incarceration. I do hope that you'll have time to reflect on your actions and grow as a person in prison, and I don't think there will be any other choice for you. And I said earlier you're a good candidate for rehabilitation, and you appear generally remorseful um, for this terrible act, which um, is refreshing compared to the last sentencing, though it's, it's just brutal for everybody to have to hear about this again. It really is for everybody. Uh, Q is the chronological age of the defendant and the features of youth, including immaturity, impetuous city, and the failure uh, to appreciate risks and consequences. This is a mitigating factor uh, that you were a minor when you committed this crime. The law treats you as an adult for the prosecution, but um, I am to consider your immaturity um, and failure to appreciate risks and consequences in, de in determining your appropriate sentence. You didn't appreciate the consequences of your actions, but that does not bring Nohema Graber back here. And uh, your age and, and remorse are actually, I thought they would be less a comfort to Miss um, Graber's family, but it appears that it is of some comfort, at least to, to some. regard to the family and home environment uh, with your circumstances, Mr. Goodell, and again before this week, I didn't really know much about that. Um, certainly your home life was not the same since your mother left. While you have a complicated uh, relationship with your father, he does care for you and so do your siblings. Your home life may have been atypical, but you were not a troublemaker prior to the tragic events of November 2nd, 2021. I find this to be a mitigating factor. Letter S is the circumstances of the murder, ex including the extent the defendant's participation and the conduct and way familial and peer pressure may have affected the defendant. Uh, this is a mitigating factor to the extent Mr. Uh, Miller was the driving force behind the murder of Ms. Graber. But as I said earlier, Mr. Miller couldn't have done with this without you, Mr. Goodell. There's no family influence on the murder. In a perverse way, you did feel peer pressure. Uh, but this was not cheating on a math test. Uh, this was the premeditated murder of a human being because Mr. Miller did not like his grade. Letter T has me consider the competencies associated with youth, including but not limited to the defendant's inability to deal with peace officers or the prosecution or the defendant's incapacity to assist the defense attorney and defendant's defense. Uh, this is a mitigating factor due to your uh, lack of prior contact to law enforcement. Um, and I will say that uh, you were represented by um, experienced and talented attorneys who zealously advocated uh, for your rights. Um, say the same about the state just to, to keep it uh, fair but um, in considering that factor um, certainly you had the benefit of, of excellent legal representation the possibility of rehabilitation uh, is a significant mitigating factor you're a very good candidate for rehabilitation while incarcerated you'll be able to take advantage of the programming and education in the Iowa prison systems uh, when paroled, uh, hopefully you have the skills to be a productive and law-abiding member of society based on the record of this case and of the record of, of Mr. Miller's case because I learned uh, somewhat about you in that case as well and then the evidence presented on your behalf here and at other hearings. Letter V, uh, is any information uh, considered relevant by the sentencing court? 
And as I've stated, uh, the, the U.S. and Iowa Constitution treats juveniles differently um, than adults at sentencing. Um, I think this was mentioned earlier, but if, if, if you had helped Mr. Miller uh, 18 months later, you'd be uh, in prison for the rest of your life. So I hope that is not lost either. Uh, I believe the bedrock of our criminal justice system remains the same, and that's deterrence and rehabilitation. I've considered your youth and developing brain, along with your intent and actions, which I think were cruel. In State versus Majors, which is a 2020 Iowa Supreme Court case, 940 Northwest 2nd, 372, Iowa Supreme Court Justice Waterman wrote that, quote, our earlier opinions have been criticized for running the risk of making it difficult if not practically impossible for a sentencing judge to ever impose a minimum term of incarceration. Yet, as we indicated in Roby, mandatory minimum sentences are permissible. While there is a presumption against mandatory terms of incarceration for juvenile offenders, we have expressly upheld, even commanded, their use if the court concludes that sentence is warranted after consideration of the factors. And uh, Mr. Goodell, I believe because sentencing judges are in a unique position to deter homicidal and other violent behavior, um, while it may seem natural for a judge from Iowa to punt, uh, in this case to the parole board, um, I don't think the parole board is adequate uh, in its function that I have and the obligation and the oath that I take to protect the community. And I believe judges at the district court level and the trial court level are much better positioned to order criminal sentences than the parole board. Court finds, based on the nature and circumstances of this defense, along with the 25 required factors I'm required to consider in sentencing a juvenile for first degree murder, the defendants shall be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. The sentence is permissible under current Iowa law. The presumption against mandatory minimum sentences has been rebutted by the nature of circumstances of this case. And it represents the appropriate time of incarceration based on the defendant's premeditated murder. Count two of this case will be dismissed pursuant to plea agreement. Mr. Goodell, do you agree to pay the dismissal costs on the conspiracy charge? The Iowa, the Iowa Medical and Classification Center in Oakdale is designated as a reception center to which you're to be be delivered by the Sheriff of Jefferson County or his designee. Again, you're given all credit for time served on this charge, including any juvenile detention center time. You do have the right to appeal your guilty plea. Uh, your attorney must file a written notice within 30 days, and a plea of guilty is subject to a showing of good cause. Uh, pursuant to Iowa Code Section 81429, and then the appellate courts will determine whether your application is granted. If you're just appealing the sentence I've just imposed and not the guilty plea, your attorneys must file that notice of appeal within 30 days, serve the written, as, written notice of that appeal upon the county attorney, and, and file the same with the clerk of court, together with evidence of such service upon the county attorney, and you must promptly mail or deliver an informational copy to the Iowa Attorney General. The service and the filing of a written notice of the appeal and the time and manner just specified as jurisdictional, and a failure to comply with such requirements shall be deemed a voluntary waiver by you of your right to appeal. You may be entitled to court-appointed counsel to represent you on an appeal, Mr. Goodell, in uh, preparation of a transcript of the proceedings uh, that we've had in this court at state expense. 
Judgment accordingly, minimus accordingly, bond and appeal is hereby fixed the amount, um, no bond. Council, do we need to make a record on anything else? Nothing else I can think of. There you are. Wish you luck, Mr. Goodell, and I hope everybody else uh, in this room can heal as well. We'll close the record.